Hey, what's up? This is Kevin from Kevin's Barbecue Joints, and this one's great. It's with Jeremy Yoder from Mad Scientist Barbecue. I talked to him about four years ago, and obviously a lot in the world has changed, but a lot in his life has changed. When we last spoke, he lived in Woodland Hills, and he was doing pop-ups and catering. But then after the pandemic hit, things shifted, and now he lives in Kentucky. He has a highly, highly successful, I'll put a link below, successful YouTube channel at current time. 447,000 subscribers. His videos are extremely informative and I wanted to get his philosophy about making videos and where he gets his ideas. And a lot of the stuff he does are just ideas that he has. He's not watching other people's YouTube channels and seeing what they do and then trying to make a video like theirs or to try to figure out something that they haven't done. His are purely from his head and his curiosity. And as the name says, there's a lot of science to it. And something that I know that you guys love and that I love are pits and barbecue you pits and offset smokers and he talks a lot about those he talks about all the ones that he has and all the ones he's doing videos on and he's done a bunch of new ones too so i'll put links below to all those because those are those are great give great insight into pits that you may not own but are interested in owning he also talks about beef tallow because that was a big thing with a number of his videos and let me talk about his favorite collab and we talk about a barbecue joint that is on his wish list and why it's on his wish list. And then we end talking about his Patreon channel, and I didn't know how amazing his Patreon channel was. And there's different tiers that you can sign up for. I'll put a link to that as well below. But one of the key things is when you sign up for Patreon with him, you get access to his Discord. And the Discord is kind of like a message board if you don't know what Discord is, but it's private and people ask questions and you can ask questions and people answer quickly. And he jumps on and it gives you direct access to Jeremy where you wouldn't have it otherwise. He also puts out special videos specifically for Patreon. And then he has these contests and these giveaways and they're not just for like hokey little stuff. They're like for $4,000 pits. They're for, he's giving away all the pits that he doesn't use. So, so I can't imagine why you wouldn't want to sign up for his Patreon. But I'll cut this intro short because we talked for almost an hour. It's so great to catch up with Jeremy. So great to hear about everything he's doing. He's so insightful, he's so thoughtful. And I can't thank him enough for taking the time. In the end, stay safe and visit your local barbecue joint. Well, good morning, Jeremy, how are you? Good, I'm, I'm doing well, I'm doing well. So I'm on Eastern time now, which is, you know, it's weird to set up meetings because for me, I'm thinking 10 o'clock, but you're over there early in the morning, 7 a.m. doing this uh -huh. meeting. Yeah, 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 and this is how I kind of do uh, all my interviews around this time because it seems like it works for a lot of the Texas people that I talk to or central people central time zone people are like nine o'clock kind of is a sweet spot for them. If it's a day off for them, they can kind of sleep in a little bit, I, I think. And then yeah. a, lot of, a lot of the guys I talk about on the West coast, yeah. 10, I mean, on the East coast, 10 o'clock. Yeah. Works, makes sense. Works out. All right. But yeah. And I, I've had some people say like, can we do like 8 AM? And I'm like, that's 5 AM for me <laughs> <Is that laughs> at 4 30. I'll try. I'll give my best, but, uh, but it's, we've, I wanted to check in with you because as I was checking, our last interview was April, I think it was posted on the 19th of 2019, which was over three years ago. And at that time, you, I, I live in Woodland Hills, you lived in Woodland Hills, you, I don't know if you were still, were you still a teacher or were you transitioning or? I think, I think that was the first year that I wasn't teaching full time, I was still tutoring. I think I was mainly doing like the barbecue catering stuff that, that took up the, the bulk of my time at that point. At barbecue HQ is that at that place where you're doing stuff there too? Or? Uh, I did a little bit of stuff there, but um, mostly it was um, catering events for weddings or, you know, offices, or uh, I would do one barbecue pop-up every month. Uh, oh yeah. 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 So that's, that's most of what I was doing. And you had a fat stack. That already... Yeah. Yeah. I was one of the first people to get one actually. Uh -huh. um, uh, it's a really crazy story how that happened. I was, uh, at my church's uh, junior high summer camp, I'm walking through the woods and I see a smoker next to a cabin. And so I knock on the door and I'm like, hey, uh, this is weird, but can I use your smoker? The guy's like, uh, sure. So I, I took <laughs> it get for, for all the staff who were there. And then um, I was talking to the guy and uh, I, I was saying, yeah, you know, I'd really like to get a bigger smoker. I just don't know any place close by that would have one. Uh, or that, that makes them. And he's like, oh, you should check out this company, Fat Stack Smokers on Instagram. So I did. I called him up. I went down to the shop and I was like the sixth or seventh person to get a smoker from them. Wow. And I didn't know that. Yeah. I'd never heard of him before, but fortunately I found a smoker in the woods. So, 
the old smoke of the woods that sounds like a kid like a kid's book someday but uh, it's twice, <laughs> was it a, well, maybe you never know you've, the way that you've you've transitioned you know the sky's the limit pretty much it's was that a deck of 250 or something out there or? no it was uh it wasn't a fat stack it was uh one that the guy made himself like he's kind of like uh oh okay, okay. yeah he's like a big beard you know cuts trees down with his chainsaw mountain man type of guy and he welded himself a smoker and it was um it wasn't pretty, but it was functional. I mean, cook, break, yeah. barbecue. Uh, but uh, yeah, so he was kind of in tune with barbecue Instagram and stuff like that. And he happened to see Fat oh. Stack. And you've done, I know that over the, like since since we've spoken, you have, you've did you build your own smoker with them? With Fat Ish. Stack? Ish. Ish. So, like Eric helped you out or you helped Eric out on a couple parts of it? Or? Uh, so uh, the thing was, so I've used Fat Stack stuff on my, um, on my YouTube channel for a long time. And I'm a really big fan of the quality of stuff that they make. I think they make just tremendous cookers. You know, they had talked to me in the past about, hey, maybe we can sign you up for some kind of deal to where you can get like referral credits or something like that. Um, and I said, no, no, I don't, I don't want to take any money from you guys because I want people to know that when I talk about your smokers, there's no money changing hands that's going to make me say nice things. Yes. I was like, but someday, if you could let me use your shop and build a smoker, that would be awesome. And so they said, sure. And then um, I realized that uh, I was going to be moving out of California. And so I called him up and I was like, hey, I really need to build that smoker like right now. And so I just had to pay for the cost of materials and stuff. And um, I did most of the body of the smoker. Uh, there were a couple of things that required more skillful welding than I was able to do um, that Eric did for me. And then uh, I had a uh, a company called SG Metalworks, mm -hmm. I think they're in Rialto, yeah. uh, built a trailer for it. Because my reasoning was, you know, if uh, this flange on the door breaks because I did a bad job welding, well, that stinks, but it's not a huge deal. But if the trailer falls apart while I'm driving on the highway, yes, that is a big deal. So it I need happens to people. Yeah, I need a professional to do that part. And they, yeah. I think the SG, uh, yeah, SG Metalworks, they, uh, do you know the Smoke Queen, uh, winning the Smoke Queen? She's in, she's oh, at yeah. Smorg now. She, uh, I think she has two pits from them. Oh, okay. Awesome. Yeah, this is, a, it's just a, it's a small world. And, and then once you start to like delve into pits and stuff, you realize that like there's cross, big people, people have pits that you had no idea that who built it, but uh, it's kind of nice. I like, I love to highlight who built these pits, but now when you were in, were you, were you thinking when I talked to you, were you planning on moving back East and do you live in, is it Kentucky? Is that where you live? Or? Kentucky now. Yeah. I grew up in Kentucky. So we moved back. Um, so uh, at the time we talked, I don't think I had any set plans because, you know, I had uh, for the last year that I was teaching, you know, I was doing barbecue events, multiple barbecue events pretty much every weekend. And so that meant not a lot of sleep, but it also meant that when I quit teaching, I had, you know, built in business. Mm -hmm. so I wouldn't be starting from zero. Um, and so I had kind of built in, uh, you know, a couple regular things, um, certain offices, they'd be like, okay, once a quarter, we want you to feed all, you know, 487 people in the office, you know, which is a good gig. Yeah. Um, and then I had the, the brewery I would do once a month and then, uh, you know, weddings and referrals. And, uh, when I first started off, you know, if somebody called me and said, Hey, can you do? And I would just say, yes, you know, was like, even. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter how many people I, I will do it. Um, and then it, it eventually got to be to where I, I would do the events that, that made sense to mm -hmm. do. So some of them, um, like I remember I once did an event for 15 people and, you know, uh, I couldn't charge them a ton of money for it because then they would be spending way too much per person. But I was like, I just need to do it, you know, hand out cards. And then eventually that, that got me to um, do one of the most lucrative gigs that I've ever done. You know, I was feeding a whole office of like 800 people, you know, do oh, that so, yeah. so, so, th so that's actually a good tip for people that, you know, sometimes you have to you know, swallow your pride, but you don't want to lose money every time you do something, but Right. Yeah. And then there was this thing that happened. I don't know if you heard about it. It was a virus that was going around. It's called SARS-CoV-2. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not familiar. Anyway, so I thought, well, I got two weeks off. This is going to be awesome. I'm going to relax around the house. I'm going to watch TV and then back to work. And then uh, my wife was uh, probably six months pregnant at the time. Uh, and I was like, two weeks off. Yeah, I can. Yeah, this is great. And then um, it turned into a lot longer than two weeks. And so I thought, well, I can't afford to, you know, make zero dollars with a catering business that can no longer function. So I started making more YouTube videos because before that it had been, you know, sometimes a month between videos, sometimes three months between videos. Uh, yeah, okay. Because, 
yeah, my, my wife would, you know, film the videos and she was at work during the week and almost every weekend I had a catering gig. And so she would be helping with that. And it was a rare circumstance that we would both be available on the weekend to actually produce content. And so I thought, well, if I can't do catering, I can do videos and, um, you know, I'll just go in a hundred percent on, on doing that. And we did a bunch of videos and then, uh, my daughter was born. We moved to Kentucky because, uh, I thought, well, I could get the catering business up and running there. Um, and you know, a lower cost of living and be closer to family. It just seemed to make sense all the way around. And so moved to Kentucky and kept doing, you know, try to do one video every week. And, uh, it turned into, um, well, it kind of stumbled into it, but it turned into what I do is like the, the main thing now is make YouTube content. Yeah. How crazy is that? Like you would never have thought like it, it and, and the fact that a pandemic pushed you into there. And a lot of people that I've spoken to, the pandemic has, has shifted and changed and, and they've become even more successful since the pandemic, which you would, you wouldn't think a pandemic would help, would help people along with their path in life, but it seemed right. to, and what, and, and traveling out like, do you feel better living out in Kentucky? In your mind, like, is it clearer? Is it because because where we live, it's it's pretty dense. Yeah, um, I don't know that I would I would say it like that. Uh, the the pace of life is slower here for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I, I live just outside of Louisville, Kentucky, um, but it's so I I live in a suburb, I guess, but it's a slower pace of life. There, there are some places like where, where I was born in Michigan is a kind of a small place, but it kind of has the feeling like it's progressively dying. Like, you know, it's slow, but it's on its way out. Um, this doesn't have that feeling. It's slow, but it's just because the pace of life for people here is that speed. Um, and so it's just comfortable and, and nice and people are friendly and, you know, it's just a uh, I like it a lot. Where I live, it's not an awful place at all. It's just a nice place, but it's just, it doesn't seem like it's not very neighborly. There's maybe if you lived up maybe in the hills further, like there's people that would, you, you know your neighbors, but a lot of places, I live in an apartment complex right now. No one really, <laughs> no one talks to each other. Like I, talk, I say hi to everyone. Everyone's like, it's like a weird thing that I say hi to everyone. But yeah. I, it, it's just my nature. And that's why I've, I've often thought, and I, I imagine I'll be living in a smaller town just because I like, I like a slower pace and then travel. But it just, yeah, uh, it's a weird phenomenon where the more people you have around you, the less you know about all of them. Yeah. Now it's, you know, like I can walk out and talk to my neighbor, Doug, right? Have a conversation for 30 minutes, right? Whereas when I lived in an apartment, I was surrounded by people. I didn't know anybody, didn't talk to anybody. Uh -huh. You know, now yeah. that I have two neighbors, you know, we, we know each other. And what's funny too, is you don't have to, like you honestly, you could just live your life without even talking to your neighbors. You don't really necessarily need them unless there's like a you know, fire alarm or there's something that's that goes off. But now where you live on your, on your new video, all your videos, is that your backyard or your front yard? Is that where you're filming? Uh, I guess you'd be looking at the backyard. Yeah. The backyard. Sometimes I think that you've been on your driveway. Is that maybe, or is that? Yeah. So it's <laughs> all the smokers are on the driveway because uh, <laughs> most of the smokers that I have are, are, are on casters and it rains here enough to where if I ever got those into the backyard, they would never leave without like a forklift. When you move back there, you move back with your fat stack. And then mm -hmm. as your channel, like, was there a specific video? Was it your how to smoke brisket? Is that the, the video that kind of propelled you or was that like what can you remind can you remember for people that might not no, know or was it your franklin one or you i don't think it was any video in particular um because I, I mean if i had a video that that does well um you'd see a little bit of a boost but there was there was no big jump in um oh, the number of subscribers that i had there there are some videos that uh, did really well like the the how to smoke a brisket video um did well stuff like that but uh, I think it's just, I think it's more, I think people are more willing to subscribe when they've seen several of your videos and they're like, oh, you know, I think this guy has something He's valuable. He's consistent about what he, uh, yeah. Yeah. The message. And, yeah. And then, so you could, you could do some videos, you know, that are just designed to teach and help people like the how to smoke a brisket video. Some people try to, I don't know, work the algorithm on on youtube and you know they're going to use these tags or or they, they think a lot about it i, yeah, I don't yeah. at all yeah, yeah. i just all i think about is i'm going to make a video that i would want to watch mm -hmm. it's like what would i want to see it's like let me go test this out 
because I'd want to see what happens. And then I make a video about it. And you're doing it the same way. I, like, I don't know. I think there's probably, there's probably a method to it that you, if you were, if I was a little bit smart, like more savvy, but I just want to talk to people that I want to talk to that I would hope to want people would want to hear their stories or visit places or do things that like, you know, that I'm interested in and hopefully that people are interested too. That's, but that's it. That's interesting that you would do it that way, but it, it's interesting how, like I've watched it progress and I've seen, but also too, like when you, when you order the Franklin brisket, I'm like, ah, cause I was like <laughs> trying to order one too. I'm sure a lot of people were trying to, to get one because it would, it just seemed like an interesting video for people. And it would also be interesting to see that, like the comparison. And then you've, like, you've expanded so much. What was the second smoker or se second pit that you got? Do you remember like the progression of how? So I had a few different smokers in LA. Uh, but then I had to sell them in order to finance my move to Kentucky okay. because when, when, you know, I go multiple months with making $0, it's not great. No. <laughs> so the two smokers I brought with me were the fat stack 500 and then the, uh, old country Brazos, um, the old country Brazos, because it has a ton of sentimental value to me. And it's like, I would never sell it. You know, okay. I, I basically never use it now because I have way more expensive smokers, but I would never sell that thing. Um, so I came with those two. And then I think the next thing that I got was maybe it was the, I think I got a, maybe it was the Franklin, possibly the Franklin, uh, backyard offset. And then I got a Weber Smoky Mountain and then, uh, I got a Traeger, but I have since given that away. Cause I was so frustrated with that thing. <laughs> No, this one, this one is not sponsored by Traeger. Obviously, um, and then uh, did you get a primitive, or did you have a, or you just cooked on a primitive, right? Oh, I, yeah. So I've cooked on a thousand gallon primitive pit. Um, I did a a video collaboration with Google Foods, and he he called me up and uh, he was saying, "Hey, I want to do a collaboration. What did you have in mind?" And I, I was saying, "Well, I have a thousand gallon pit that I'm planning to bring out to Kentucky, and, and my plan was." I would cook a whole side of beef in it. He's like, that's a great idea. And I thought that he was going to have this, you know, killer idea, you know, the, the secret videos of Machu Picchu or something. He would, <laughs> he would, you know, let me into the inner sanctum of like where all these viral videos come from. <laughs> but no, we ended up doing that. And uh, there was a guy relatively close by who had a primitive pit and um, okay. it worked great. And uh, I'm a big fan of, uh, of that company. And uh, their sister company, Workhorse Pits. Right now, I have a Workhorse 1975. Oh, I was going to ask you. OK, you have one. OK, cool. Yeah. And so um, I'm going to be doing a video review on that. But I'm holding off um, until I place an order for one myself, because I don't want to you know, make myself further back in line. Uh, but it's, it's, it's tremendously good. OK. You know? Yeah. And that's the, yeah. And JD is like he really cares about what he's doing and the, the whole thing there. Yeah. Like you could just, and the last time I spoke with him, it was just, you could still, he still has that passion from when I spoke to him like three years ago, almost around the same time that I talked to you. And it's, it's interesting how many people, how many of the custom builders are making backyard pits and some are doing better jobs than others, but it is like, it seems like there's, and there's three, I think they have three models or three, three models. And then like the versions of those three, I think. I think it's the 57, 69, and 75, maybe. Yeah. So which, what, yeah. how big is yours? So yours is a 75, so how, how do you, what size is that? It's, uh, so th the thing is, it's a 24-inch diameter pipe, uh, which is, it makes a huge difference, yeah. I think, um, because it allows the, the smoke and gases to expand and cool. So you have um, a, a large space where you can do a lot of cooking. Uh, and the tank is... I don't remember exactly how long it is. I think I I think the cook chamber is about ninety four gallons. So I think that's what I had read too. Yeah. So that'll be nice. So people can look forward to to that video coming up. I wanted to. I had some random questions I wanted to ask you, but have you ever thought about why barbecue? Like why why barbecue has meant so much to you, and why why you've continued that path? Like why did you why did you get into barbecue? And we kind of touched on it a little bit in our first interview, but what was it that sparked sparked so to speak the the love of barbecue and why do you continue? What, what keeps you going? Yeah. So barbecue. So for me, it started with grilling. I had, when I was in high school, I was on the powerlifting team. And so like, I was like eat chicken breast and broccoli. And okay. then, you, you know, like trying to do it inside, it was just disgusting chicken breast on the George Foreman grill. And it's like choking it down. I was like, there's gotta be a better way. So I went to Kroger and got one of those, you know, kind of square, grills um 
it, it's kind of like a Weber kettle, but it's it's square in yeah. shape. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was just absolute trash. But I used that to start grilling chicken. And then I developed uh, a method where it's like, I would mix together butter, like melted butter and Lowry season salt. And I would just baste the chicken with that. Yeah. Sounds you know? good. <laughs> yeah. And so I would do that. And then, you know, I had my uncle and his family come over and I made chicken and they were like, oh, this is great. It's, you know, it's excellent. And I was like, oh, it's excellent. Right. <laughs> and so I would grill a lot uh, in, in, well, in high school and then in college, uh, whenever my fraternity would have events, it's like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll man the grill. Um, cause I just enjoyed it. I think there's just something very primal about meat being cooked with fire, mm -hmm. you know, something you don't, you don't have to, um, you know, teach people to be attracted to. So for instance, uh, at my brother's birthday party, um, he, he has an old country Brazos and, um, he had a bunch of his friends over and none of them, you know, really know who I am or, or watch barbecue YouTube videos or anything like that. But I was outside, you know, running the smoker so that he could be hanging out with his friends. And uh, after everybody got there, um, it was like moths to a flame. They all the guys come out and they're standing around the fire and just like this big circle of everybody talking, even though inside it's air conditioned and there are drinks that are cold in there. No, everybody came out and just so funny. fire and they're like, you know, asking if they could get a peek at the brisket that was in there. Um, it's something that for, for me was just attractive. And then I like doing it. And then uh, as somebody who loves to tinker and try to perfect something, um, it was it was uh, a discipline that I knew I could never perfect, but I could continually enjoy trying to, you know, I could just still get enjoyment out of improving just incrementally, just the tiniest bit. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's why I really got caught up in it. And then, um, you know, the mistakes that I made early on, I was like, well, you know, it'd probably be good if, you know, if I could make a video or something so other people don't do the stupid thing that I did mm -hmm. and uh, started making content and you know people seem to like it so I said okay well I'll keep doing it and then now for me it's just about trying to learn new things explore new ideas and uh, hopefully mm, increase the amount of knowledge we have surrounding barbecue that's and, and, you, and you're doing that and I and I've, I've wondered and I've looked at like at the beginning when I was watching your videos I would see there's the trolls, the people that would say sure. negative comments. And that's, and that's, that's across the board with everybody who does YouTube stuff. But how do you, how do you deal with that? And at first was, were you interacting with people and now do you still interact or do you hide? Like, I wonder how you deal with people because there's a lot of negativity and everyone knows everything. So, and then they're right. anonymous. So, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So to, to me, it's amazing how many people out there have cooked literally thousands of briskets and they just happen to be watching, you know, one of the videos and they tell me everything I'm doing wrong. Um, but my favorite is the person who's like, yeah, I've cooked three briskets and they've all been perfect. This guy is an idiot. He has no idea what he's talking about. Um, now I, I don't claim to know everything, uh, but the, the information I try to pass on is just what's worked best for me, what I think makes sense. And so, um, how I approach, uh, people who are just trying to troll me in videos, uh, is usually, I just ignore them. So like for me, people saying mean stuff doesn't really bother me. It actually bothers my wife a lot more, um, but it, it doesn't really bug me because what, what bugs me is when I put out content that I'm not happy with, right? So uh, what's, a, what's an example of that? So for instance, if I do a video and you know it didn't turn out quite the way I wanted, like the meat, you know, it's like, well, are we gonna reshoot this whole thing? Or is it like, okay, I just got to say, this got a little overcooked, you know, just move on. Uh, that's the only thing that bothers me. If people have mean things to say, it doesn't bug me at all. Because if, if I cared too much about what they say, then I'd be more focused on pleasing the trolls who won't say nice things about the content that I make, no matter how good no or matter bad. What, yeah. So I focus on how can I help people step up their barbecue game even a little bit. No, and, and I've noticed too that you have, You've been honest about mistakes, and I think that is important. I think that you're not just trying to put out like these fa like perfect polished videos that all like, everything works out. You, you're honest about something if you if if it's over if it, ha it has gone over if it, or if there's something wrong with it or if it's if it's dried out somewhere. You like you're you want you want to you want people to learn along with you, which is which is nice, and that's it's humbling because I think that a lot of people just want to put out these perfect videos and 
not show the, the reality of, of it. Yeah, I recently did, uh, I, I don't know if I can talk about, I think I can talk about this. I recently did um, uh, kind of a, it was like a cooking show type of thing. And um, and there, there was a lot of production that was going on. So when I do videos, it's, it's me in front of the camera, my wife behind the camera. It's a two person operation mm -hmm. for this. They had like five cameras and like 30 people behind the camera and like a couple sound engineers. And they had a, uh, a chef slash food stylist. And so, um, like the, the, so one of the things I cooked was a steak and they had a, like a stunt steak that had been cooked beforehand that looked oh. perfect that they were going to use, um, in case the one that, you know, I, I did while, you know, doing the show didn't turn out. Um, but fortunately everything worked out. We used all the food that I made. So, yeah. um, yeah, it's just, it is interesting. Like the whole, that whole, like I've seen, I've seen food, I've seen food stylists in action and how they have like spray bottle, how they, because when you see like a, see like a, a Jack in a box burger, but like, there's not Jack in a box across, or maybe there is across the United States, but, uh, and it just looks, it looks so great. And then you obviously get it and it's, you know, generally not unless you're just starving and it's just it's just interesting how 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 beautiful you can make food look and and too like i think that we're in such a culture of like instagram and people taking photos of everything and and restaurants being so concerned about you know make, building the perfect platter and bringing it out to people where you know that like the old days you just you know they wanted to put out good food it wasn't necessarily the presentation part but it's you know it's yeah yeah I think I think it's easy for people to get too caught up in that. Fortunately for me, I don't because I'm really bad at taking pictures and really bad at making things look good. Um, if you just ask my wife, um, it just I'm awful at that. So I don't even worry about that. Um, as close, this is about as close as, as I'll get. So if I were you know serving brisket at at a, at a pop up at a brewery, I'll unwrap it and I'll just slice it. Um, I take more care in slicing when I do it on a video. Uh, when I unwrap it, you know, I let some of the juices drip down onto the brisket so it looks shinier and, mm -hmm. and better. But that's about all I do to try to, you know, th th that would be different than if I were actually making this for uh, a group of people. You can get really caught up in it. Yes, <laughs> definitely. What's And so can you talk a little bit about beef tallow? Oh. <laughs> yeah. I'll, links below, links to the four, yeah. six yeah, videos. Not of Chicago that. packing. That was a, a funny uh, a funny thing. So basically in, in the, in the video, the first video I did about it, I kind of, um, I tried to lay out why I was thinking something is going on here um, for a number of different reasons. Cause I, I examined all of those, you know, Franklin videos, like they were this Zapruder film, you know, <laughs> frame by frame almost. It's like, okay, the clock says this when they're pulling them off. And they said that they went on at this time and well, that's funny. You know, just trying to piece it all together. And so I knew something was happening because the briskets that came off the smoker, they weren't in the same butcher paper as the ones that were being served uh, on the line. So I was like, something's happening, but it's glistening with lots of fat. Um, they must be adding some other kind of fat. And I was like, is it clarified butter? Could be. I mean, I don't think it's, it's just, it's not whole butter because you'd see the, the remnants of the milk solids there. And so I'm like, is it clarified butter? I don't know. And then, um, uh, I was talking to people. We, somebody suggested maybe they're using lard. Somebody said maybe they're using Crisco. Somebody said maybe they're using beef tallow. I didn't really know. And then um, I heard from somebody that they were using beef tallow. Um, and I, I didn't want to mention a name or anything. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. Yeah. And so I was like, well, if, if I do this video, then Aaron Franklin hates me, then, then that's okay. Um, because, you know, it's part of what I signed up for. I'm the one releasing the video. I don't want to you know, anybody else to get any heat for this. So I made the video, it really seemed to make a difference. And it explained kind of all the observations that I'd made. And, uh, and then the specific beef tallow that I used, what I did was I got on Amazon and ordered all the different kinds of beef tallow that they had. And it was just the Wagyu beef tallow was by far my favorite. So that's the one I used. And then um, since then, uh, I, you know, kept using it. And uh, the, the company is, is, is great to me. So I can call them up and say, Hey, can you send me like uh, 10 jars of beef tallow? They're like, absolutely. And so <laughs> uh, it's, it's uh, a good relationship to have, but uh, yeah, it, I think it explains a lot of things. Also, I have kind of two competing ideas in my head about it. So part of it is I think that a chef or a pit master um, has the right to have as many secrets about their process as possible. 
okay. or as, as they want, I should say. They can they can make the whole thing secret. You know, they they could keep the kind of wood secret. They could keep the seasoning secret. They could keep the methodology secret. You know, they could keep the kind of briskets that they're cooking completely secret. Yeah, totally fine. No issue with that. Totally respect it. My only issue is if you tell me you're doing X, but you're really not doing X then I feel like I have a right to try to figure out, well, what, what's really going on here. And so Daniel Vaughn just released an article um, about the worst kept secret in Texas barbecue mm -hmm. about the Lowry's. Mm -hmm. And uh, in it, I think uh, Aaron says that, well, I told people salt and pepper because that's all you really need. But, you know, we've used Lowry's in the past and now we use the Franklin rub. And so I, I had released a video about that, uh, about Lowry's earlier because of a John Lewis interview where he said that he's never cooked a brisket with salt and pepper in his life and i was like wait a second he was like the main pit master guy at franklin something's going on mm -hmm. here um and so i think the tallow is just one of those methodologies and when i released that video there were there were two groups of people uh one group said oh that totally makes sense i gotta try this the other group was like you're so full of crap there's no way that he does this he uses tallow to grease hinges you moron and then after a couple months there was a third group that was like well, we've known about this all along you know, and I was like, well, yeah, I get, well, you figured it out. It. But uh, yeah, so I think it's, it's a valuable method. I think it does genuinely help. Um, and uh, it's just another tool in the toolkit. Is it necessary? Absolutely not. You can make tremendous brisket without it. But does it does it give you a little something extra? Yeah. And why not? Yeah. Have you heard at all from them from back from the Franklin camp at all? <laughs> No, no, no I, I don't think that they have any idea who I am. <laughs> no, I was just curious if, like, somehow, like, somebody, like, would have, like, because you know, you've known a lot of, like, you know, we've all know people that have like, worked there and like gone through the through the ranks. So I'm just curious if anybody said anything. That's cool, and you know, who cares? I guess in the end, he does what he does, and it's separate of what you do, and it has. They don't ever really need to mesh. It's not something that it's just your teachings, your teach, and also if it's right or if it's wrong it's still something that works that works and why not use it if it works and people can test it out they could the whole goal the whole thing is to play around and try and find out what works best for you exactly yeah i'm, I'm totally with you on that so whether or not, whether or not he uses tallow um is kind of immaterial exactly. uh, because it's about how can i make my barbecue the best it possibly can be this helps me do that so that's why i use it and that's why i tell people about it because i think it can help them too um for me, it's like, okay, if, if I had to uh, choose who can make a better brisket, me or Aaron Franklin, obviously Aaron Franklin. But my goal isn't to be the world's greatest brisket maker primarily. It's how can I learn as much about this as possible and pass it along so other people can have better experiences at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, that, and you do, and that's what you do. And so it's, is there, I know you talked about your collab with Yuga. Was it Yuga? Is that what it's called? Or there were a uh... Uga, 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 Uga foods. It's a, uh, Uga is the one that owns the uh, um, uh, board apes and the uh, board ape yacht club. It's a NFT thing. So with with Uga, oh. okay. <laughs> I don't know why. I think I just read about it recently. Um, so I with don't Uga, know anything about NFTs, man. Yeah, I don't think you need to. Don't <laughs> <laughs> I, I I know a little more than I should, and it's it's not. It's a, it's a it's a weird road. But but uh, is there a collab? And I think didn't um, didn't Joe Yim wasn't he? Did, did, did he uh, help you guys with that yeah he joe, did joe did yeah yeah um yeah. he he came and assisted you guys uh did is there a, a, a person that you uh, what was your favorite collab other than that that you've done is it with a with chud or yeah probably yeah probably with uh brad robinson brad. barbecue um because first of all he's really really good um he uh knows a lot uh and and beyond that I, you know we're friends i just like him so that that makes it cool and we're close to the same age and we can talk about stuff besides barbecue and have a great time mm -hmm. and uh i think that all kind of contributes to it but probably collaborations with with him have been the most fun and, and maybe it's also because the one i did with Guga, there was like so much pressure it's like we're going to have several hundred people here to eat this whole side of wagyu beef and it's like you cook on a thousand gallon pit you never cooked on before in a place you've never been before. And so it, there was a lot of pressure. Maybe I didn't, you know, have time to you know sit back and enjoy it as much as I could have. But uh, but yeah, pr probably probably some of the collabs with him have been the most fun because they're laid back and we hang out. And yeah, it's good.
Yeah, Brad's and his his channel's awesome, and it's and he's he's so fun, and you can just tell that he he's very genuine. He is that's yep. that's who Brad Brad is. Brad, and he's always been so nice, and he we're very responsive, and it's uh, yeah, he's he's a he's a cool guy. Is there a, a, anybody like a wish list collab, or is it more like if it just happens kind of thing? Oh yeah, so I I haven't really done a lot with trying to do collaborations with people um yeah you have it yeah be, mostly because you know generally speaking when i've tried it it's like never worked out the way that i wanted it to in the past because i'm like a, a way that i do things and so it's just hard to get the video to be what i have in my head of what it should be right okay. um because there are lots of other things going on um but as far as a, a wish list so one of the things um, that people might not guess is I, I actually don't watch any barbecue YouTube videos pretty much at all. Um, it's it's very rarely do I do I watch barbecue YouTube videos, uh, and there's good and bad to that. So the good thing is I'm not trying to you know recreate something that I've seen somewhere else, yeah. and so I can kind of pursue lines of questioning that I thought would be interesting. Um, but then also sometimes, you know, I can do something that other people have talked about and I just had no idea. Like when I, I did the video on, on Larry's, uh, season salt, right? So I heard from, uh, other people that Brad had already done a video where he mentioned that. And then, uh, Jerby barbecue, uh, had done a video on it as well. I just didn't know because I hadn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but then it's like interesting things, you know, I'm not tempted to just go try to copy what somebody else did. For a lot of people, um, it might not be an issue at all. Like for Brad, I think Brad watches kind of everything and he's like, oh, well, they did this, but they didn't do this. And so he's got an idea of something to do. Um, but for me, I would just tend to probably imitate them. So I kind of pull back from, from doing that. Um, and then I can, you know, look at scientific testing of wood pellets, for instance, is something I'm working on right now. I'm like, well, which pellets uh, actually are chemically the most similar to the woods that hmm. are listed on the outside of the bag, right? I don't think anybody else is doing that. No, you know? they are. Something I'm curious to know. And so I'm working with a laboratory right now to do that testing. And then when I get the data back, I can share it with you know consumers. Oh, cool. Well, hey, look, um, I'm not telling you which pellets to buy, but these are the data and you can make your own choice. Oh, yeah. that's it. And there's a lot of people using pellets. And so yeah. that's a... Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but there's people too that like hate those people <laughs> or just think that <laughs> like it's just so sad. Like it's like let people do what they want to do. Yeah. Like a lot of people don't have time or they don't have the energy or they don't have the the passion. It's more so they just want to make they want to make good food or they want to make good food for their family. So I don't disparage how anybody cooks. They could they, as long as they do their own thing. I have a friend that I, every time we barbecue, he'd get really drunk and he'd ruin everything. And I I don't like that. I hate that. <laughs> I hate that. I always, it's just because he just start talking to people and I'm like, come on, you got to pay attention. That's just come on, please. <laughs> but, yeah. With, with pellet smokers, I, I've got nothing against pellet smokers uh, at all. I just don't like to use them very much because I like to be involved in the process mm -hmm. so that when I have something at the end, I can attribute it to, well, I managed the fire really well. And I did this, you know, kept the temperature right where I wanted it. And, you know, I can say it was because I paid close attention and I can take some of the credit for it you know? Um, and also if it's bad, then you have to take the blame for it with a pellet smoker. It's you, you're kind of removed from that a little bit. Um, and I just want to be involved in every aspect for most people though, pellet smokers make the most sense because, you know, they are, you know, really busy at work and they probably have stuff with their family. got to take their kid to ball practice and got a million things going on. They don't have 12 hours to sit out and, you know, watch a fire. So I don't begrudge anybody for using pellet smokers, but I think for me, I get the greatest enjoyment from, you know, a wood burning pit. Um, and then I, I like to bust people's chops who use pellet smokers, you know, especially the ones with the, the Wi-Fi where they can be at work and they can control it from there. I was, gonna, I was just going to say that. Yeah. Does this, does this smoker also trim and season your brisket for you? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's wild. It, it, it is. It is wild. But they actually have pits for barbecue places for restaurants that will text you if things are like are if the temperature's getting too high or if it shuts off. There's wow. there's ones. Yeah, yeah. I think I want to think Jay 
Shane R has one, I think. I remember a guy out here in LA who he'd say, yeah, like, yeah, he'd just, he'd go home and then he'd say, get a text or a, an alert on his phone and he'd go back to the <laughs> So I'm like that was just so bizarre. it just felt very like you know it yeah it just felt very removed from the whole process and that I think you know everyone could do what they want and and there, there's a there's obviously a huge huge market for those because it's it's a big deal it's a very big deal so that's that's cool that you're doing that that's really I wanted to 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 ask you because are there barbecue joints that you've gone to since we've spoken that you've really loved or is there a barbecue like kind of we've talked about a wish list for a cult lab is there a, bar, a restaurant that you're interested in going to or that you've seen online that you thought, you know, I want to visit them someday? Yeah. So one of the big ones, I, I don't know exactly where I'd been the last time uh, we had talked, but probably my favorite place was Snow's Barbecue. I just liked the atmosphere. The food was amazing, of course. Um, and it was just a really cool experience. And you see like the, the, the cattle being sold at auction, you know, just down, yeah, the, street. Right down the street. Yeah. It was just really super cool. But place I'd like to go is John Lewis Bar. I think it's called Lewis Barbecue. Maybe John Lewis Barbecue. I think it's in, Lewis Barbecue. Yeah, in South Carolina. Um, so, so for instance, when it comes to cooking brisket, like uh, Brad uh, from Chud's Barbecue and Joe Yim and uh, um, Jerby Barbecue, like they all have a lot more experience with cooking barbecue, and they can cook better barbecue than I can, right? So that's that's not really my niche, I guess, because um, I didn't come from a restaurant background and then start doing videos. Yeah. I came from cooking in the backyard and it's like, uh, how can I make it better? Yeah, learning. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, but John Lewis Barbecue, uh, well, among those people who are like, you know, in the know uh, in Central Texas, um, he's kind of revered as a guy who is like an innovator and, and developed a lot of new things um, like the, the rubs that are common, but not really talked about in a lot of those top places. And I think maybe even the beef tallow thing and just basically the way that Austin barbecue now looks is in large part due to the influence of John Lewis. Mm -hmm. So I want to go to his restaurant and try his food because I'm sure it's going to be amazing. And, you know, I'd love to pick his brain and learn as much as I possibly can. So that's kind of on the wish list of I got to get out there and, and, and got to see how he does those things. Yeah. And I think he has a second, like a Tex-Mex or something restaurant that does so. I think so. I think yeah. so. so. How far away are you from Charleston? You know, I'm not sure. Uh, I, wonder. <laughs> I, just, I don't know, I don't know yeah. that part of the country that well. It'd be a, I don't know. I'm kind of curious now. Yeah. Um, I remember thinking I would drive. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. That'd be a nice drive. Nine hours. Nine hours. Yeah. So you could do that in a day. Yeah, you could do that in a day and you could probably at maybe stop somewhere and like go somewhere. Like there, I'm sure that on, along the way, there might be even another barbecue place or something barbecue related on, on the way if you wanted. Yeah. But nine hours, you could just do that stretch. Yeah, you could do that. And it beats the heck out of driving from California to Kentucky, though, I'll tell you that. <laughs> How long did it take that? Did you take two days? Or did... uh, we did it in two days, I think. Um, it's So I remember when we drove, so it was my brother who drove with me, but uh, we left Lexington, Kentucky, and we didn't stop for anything but gas until we got to Albuquerque. Stop for gas, switch drivers, and um, we just made our way out here. Um, well, made our way out there uh pretty quickly i think it was like 38 hours total time including time stopped yeah it's not a lot of fun but nine hours we could do in a day and and then also for, for me to be put back in the spectator seat of like i just get to go enjoy barbecue yeah is the best thing ever so when i like if i go eat at Leroy and lewis in austin or if i go to franklin barbecue or if i go to snows or if i go to john lewis barbecue um I'm, i don't i guess it's lewis barbecue if i go there I get put back in that same place that really got me hooked on barbecue mm -hmm. to begin. It's like you try it and you're like, oh wow, this is great. So and I don't think you've been to Goldie's yet, have you? No, that's a place I have to go. I mean, yeah. that's number one. So you don't you don't just stumble your way into number one on the Texas monthly list. You obviously need to be doing things right. And all and, those guys have a pedigree that gets miles long and the, f the food looks phenomenal. Everyone I've talked to has has loved it. Even if it was like, say, it became like it was number five. Like they're doing everything from scratch, even the bread from scratch. So that's 
that's something that and all those guys and they're so young too it's like so it's so awesome that it's a bunch of young because you know a lot of times it's like the stalwarts like the people that are the older barbecue joints that that become number one but they they were around for i think a year prior to or like a year and a half when they got on the list yeah it just goes to show that if you make great food people will eventually come it might take a while for people to know about it but um you know for them if I've heard from people who've eaten there and they say it is every bit as good as we'd be led to believe by Texas Monthly. And so, um, yeah, it, people will go there, then they'll tell people. And then uh, eventually something like Texas Monthly will will roll through and yeah. realize that it's awesome. And then people come in droves, which is a little bit sad for the people who knew about it before yeah. it, it got big because they could probably go there and not have to wait in line. And now they're guaranteed to wait in the line, mm-hmm. but good for them. I, just the quality of food that they make is, is going to set itself apart and, and really pay off for them, which yeah. is great. And, I, and I've talked to, a, a, I think I've interviewed four of the five or six for, <laughs> I've interviewed a number of people that work there and they, there's times a day, there's times that you can come where the lines aren't as bad and they're getting better and better. They've got a, they got another mill scale pit. So have you cooked on a mill scale pit? I have not. Uh, no, I haven't. It's tangent, I've, very tangential, but I was curious. Yeah, I've seen them and I've always wanted to. Uh, and actually, when I was in Austin last last month, um, I think I sent them a message asking if I could, you know, come see the operation. Yeah. And then they said no. And I was like, oh, man. <laughs> I know. So, but, 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 but maybe eventually you'll. But they, they, and they have a backyard pit, too. Uh, yeah, the Mill Scale 94. Mm-hmm. um yeah so i've seen that and hopefully soon i'll be able to cook on one i i have a subscriber who's got one he's like yeah absolutely come oh, cook cool. on it. i'm like all right we'll twist my arm okay that's fun that's so, awesome and yeah. then with i wanted i you're kind of your youtube I mean, YouTube, your instagram has changed now you have kind of you have more little short videos that are what are those, are those reels <laughs> i hate that i don't know this but I, yeah yeah uh the thing about instagram is I promise I'm telling you the truth when I tell you I don't even know how to upload a photo to Instagram. Okay. Yeah, that makes me so, happy. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as someone who was born Amish, I feel like I have a little bit of an excuse to not be great with technology. But uh, mostly for me, because I don't really use Instagram all that much. Um, so I like my wife um, and uh, actually one of my former students, um, they edit uh, some of the video content and put it into shorter bite-sized things like reels uh that came about because um my wife was talking to me about you know tiktok and youtube shorts and stuff like that and you know we need to be putting out content you know in those kind of packages because that's a lot of what people are consuming uh, so we need to do that and then i said well what if we took some of the videos that i've done before and we just get you know the salient points and you know, it's into a 60 second video. And it's like, if you want a full throated explanation of everything that's going on, you can watch the regular YouTube video, but you can get an idea of what's happening right here. If it intrigues you, then great. Smart. If not, then you haven't wasted 30 minutes watching a video. Uh, you've only wasted maybe 60 seconds. Yeah, no, I, I looking at Instagram now, like I feel, I feel so old because I feel, I'm like scrolling and I'm like, how do these people do these? I like get this feels very like there's like everything's moving and there are videos and it feels like very well produced. And, and it's probably, it's probably this a program that people are using or, or multiple programs, but it just feels very, it's different. I love, for me, I'm just like, I like to post photos. That's just kind of, it just makes, I feel very archaic. Like I feel like, like I'm like one step further than you in being able to do like the, I could I could do, put a video up, but I, I don't think I'm doing it right. It's and with the YouTube short, is there a link specifically to the YouTube shorts, or there? Because I noticed that I, one of my videos became a like a short. And I'm like, how did that happen? Um, I don't know. I guess somebody else must have done that. Uh, I have a separate YouTube shorts channel oh, that that called Mad Scientist Barbecue Shorts, uh, and the reason I did that is because a pet peeve of mine is when I go to the, the a channel's page and like and i click on videos and it's populated with a bunch of shorts uh, uh, i gotta search for like the real videos amidst the shorts that's smart that's good so uh, it's just mad scientist bbq shorts is that channel okay um, cool okay i'll put a link to that content and putting it in a different package oh cool okay well is there anything that we that that you want people to know about you or about what's coming up or like we've kind of covered the gamut but no i don't i don't really think so um well one thing is uh I guess, Patreon. So I, I started a Patreon since the, the beginning of the year. Okay. And um, 
uh, that's really, really cool um, for, for two reasons. One is I have a Discord linked to that Patreon page. And so it's basically a private chat where other barbecue nerds are all in there and they're talking about, hey, I tried this, this didn't work, or well, hey, cool. found this new rub, check it out. Or, hey guys, I've never cooked um, uh, beef cheeks before. Has anybody ever done them? How'd you do them? And then guaranteed somebody will you know, pop in and say, I do it like this and for this long at this temperature. And then I take them out and then I you know, mop them with X, Y, or Z. Uh, so that's tremendously helpful and it's a lot of fun. Uh, and so I, I enjoy just talking to folks on the Discord because um, for barbecue nerds, oftentimes it's difficult to find other people who love barbecue as much as you do. Mm -hmm. But in the Discord, there's like hundreds of other people who love barbecue just as much as you. And you could you know geek out on it forever. And so that's a lot of fun. And then the other thing is um, I do contests every month on Patreon to give away smokers because uh, mm -hmm. I have what, like 12, 14 smokers or something like that. And I don't use them all. There are a few that I use all the time. So the Fat Stack 120, use that all the time. Uh, my 500, use it all the time. Uh, and then for grilling, I use the Birch Barrel all the time. And then there's basically a dozen other smokers and grills that don't get ah. used. And so for me, like with the Fat Stack 80 that um, uh, I'm going to announce the winner for that, I think, tomorrow. Um, but it would make me a lot happier if a subscriber can get that and use it every weekend and love it and That's awesome. you know, give it a good home. So um, I'm giving those away. I'm going to give away the Franklin pit um, the, for the, for the same reason, um, you know, different grills, a 250 quart Yeti cooler, uh, basically things that you'll actually want um, because there's this weird phenomenon to where when I was first starting out, nobody wanted to work with me on anything. <laughs> Right. Zero. That's one of the reasons why I don't have a Yoder smoke, but um, nobody wanted to work with me at all. And then now um, it's like lots of people like, hey, can we send you this? Can we send you this? Can we send you this? Um, and I'm thinking, well, I would much rather it go to somebody who could really use it. Yeah. And so doing it on Patreon like that is, is a way to um, first off, weed out the trolls. And then second, um, make sure it's going to, all those things go to a good home where somebody's going to be using it and giving it the love that it needs. Do you have a specific, do you have different levels for the Patreon or is it just one level or? Yeah, there, there are different levels. There are different tiers on Patreon. Okay. Um, but to enter the contest, it, it's all the tiers are, you can okay. enter. Um, and it might be post a picture of a brisket or, uh, do a product review or, um, you know, send your best video idea. And then I go through them and, and find the one that I think is the best. And that person will get the prize that month. So, and you have probably exclusive content on your Patreon as well, right? Yeah. So we do some exclusive videos uh, on there and then uh, product reviews, stuff like that, that cool. are only accessible to patrons. And then because it's a, a smaller community, they can request things. So for instance, on the Workhorse 1975 on a trailer, um, sent something out to the folks on the Patreon Discord. It's like, hey, I'm going to be doing a review on this, um, but I'm going to do some cooking videos with it first. I'm going to make a review for you guys, first of all, because I've cooked on it enough now to really have a good sense of it. I'll do a review for you guys and answer any questions you have. Send me a list of questions and then that'll be only for patrons until, um, well, th that'll remain only for patrons. And then eventually on the YouTube channel, we'll do a uh, regular normal review. After That's great. It. And it's a great way for people to engage with you on yeah. a, on a smaller level, as opposed to just asking a question at the bottom of the video or. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and, and then I do uh, barbecue classes and that always gets announced on Patreon first. So if people want to join the class. Oh, cool. They have the first crack at it and stuff. So it's a, a chance for everybody to, to get together and actually have hands-on experience with barbecue because um, I didn't want to do a class where it's like, this is how I trim a brisket. And this is how I season it. And then voila, look at that magic. This one is ready to wrap. This is how I wrap it up. And oh, magic, this one is completely done. Let's cut it up. And, and you know, because you would get the same thing on a video, mm -hmm. right? So I wanted people to have firsthand experience. So everybody who does the class, everybody gets their own brisket, their own pork butt, their own rack of ribs, their own chicken, and we cook them together start to finish. So instead of me saying, this is what the fat should feel like, they get to feel what the fat feels like. And it's like, ah, it's Which is... too firm. And they have the hands-on, you know, from start to finish 
And th that way they don't have any questions about what happened. It's they were actively participating in wow. everything that happened during the cook. That's how you learn the best is by doing it and actually doing it along with somebody. Oh, that's cool too. So that'll be, that's those classes. Though they're announced first on Patreon and then they're announced publicly, but that's also something that, that is coming up. You'll be having classes throughout the year. Yeah, I think so. Well, so far they, they pretty much filled up on, on Patreon before they, they make it public, but um, okay. uh yeah, because I wanted to, for me, I want to make the Patreon something that's really useful. That's to great. Them. You know, so, so it's, it's, they get to, you know, message me directly. Um, they get priority access to uh, barbecue classes. They, you know, can enter uh, the contest to, to win free stuff that you actually want instead of like, hey, here's a $25 knife. It's like, no, here's like a $4,000 smoker. Just promise me you'll use it. Yeah. And um, then, and then Discord and the Discord's cool too. Discord's I've been in discords. That's a, that's a great way to interact and people help each other out in discords. They hundred oh, percent. So that's, oh, that's, that's really cool. That's something important to talk about. I'm glad we, I'm glad you brought that up. And I'll, and if you, if all I can find, I'll find a link. Where is it? Where are the other links? Do they reside on your YouTube channel? Can you find links off the, I think so. Uh, I don't, don't just patreon.com slash mad scientist barbecue. Maybe is that probably, I, I don't know. Um, we can, we can email it to you. But but that's something that I've intentionally kept myself away from is any of the technical stuff. Um, but I can find out and let you know. Yeah, something like yeah. Yeah, because I I am a patron um, for a, it's a small YouTube channel. Um, but basically, I got frustrated because the only thing that would come out is every once in a while they'll like post a picture, uh, and I was like, <laughs> I thought it was supposed to be like videos. Yeah. So I wanted to make sure that on the Patreon page there's actually useful stuff coming out mm -hmm. that that's going to make it worthwhile for, for people to be there. It was so good to talk to you, Jeremy. It's, you know, it's been a while and hopefully if the next time we see each other, it'll be in person somewhere, maybe uh, Lewis barbecue or somewhere else, but yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, awesome. thanks. Have a good one. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Okay. Take care. Bye.